Welcome to this Royal United Services Institute, New South Wales monthly lecture. I'm Michael Howe. I'm the president of RUSI New South Wales. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us for this important webcast. Firstly, I'd like to pay tribute to our First Nation people who have been custodians of the land in Australia, to pay our respects to the tribal elders past, present and future, and in particular, to acknowledge the service of any ADF First Nation members who are currently or have previously served. This year, our RUSI monthly lecture theme has, wherever possible, been the theme of improving Australia regional security. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce this month's lecturer, Major General Stephen Jobson, AM, CSC, who is the newly appointed head uh, commander of the Australian Army Aviation Command. We're very pleased that Major General Jobson, in the middle of his frantic schedule, uh, has agreed to pre-record this webcast and to agree that it can be broadcast. We are delighted that we have the commitment of such a senior person and I'd like to advise you that if you'd like to find a little more of Major General uh, Jobson's background and history, then firstly, we always have an RUSI newsletter, which if you go to our website, you can find uh, some details of Major General Jobson. And very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge his distinguished service. He joined through the ADFA program, graduated and was allocated to Aviation Corps, and has commanded aviation units and also the Army Recruit Training Centre at all ranks from Troop Leader, Troop Commander, uh, Commanding Officer of the Aviation Regiment and the Aviation Brigade. He served overseas with the 82nd Airborne and has also seen service in Bosnia-Herzegovina, if that is the correct pronunciation, uh, and Afghanistan. It's a mark of great distinction that he has been appointed to command the first Major General to head up Army Aviation Command, and we're delighted that he's willing to share with us his understanding and his perception of the role of this un upgraded capability in the Australian Defence Force. It's therefore with great pleasure that I welcome and thank Major General Stephen Jobson and invite him to speak to us as the newly appointed commander of the Army Aviation Command. Over to you, sir, and thank you. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, I'm Major General Stephen Jobson, the Commander of Army's newest functional command, Army Aviation Command. And I'm delighted today to be with you uh, and to uh, present to such an esteemed audience. So thank you very much. As you're aware, the overarching theme for 
uh, lectures of 2022 is improving Australia's regional security. To that end, I've been asked to take some time to discuss uh, with you the newly formed Army Aviation Command as it nests with our current strategic uh, context, uh, as well as defence and Army's modernisation initiatives. In particular, I'll be outlining how Army's aviation capability under its own command will optimise Army aviation to better support land, amphibious and special operations forces. I'll also outline how the current plans for the introduction into service of new helicopters and uncrewed aerial uh, systems, uh, as well as how Army Aviation Command will enhance and assure the effectiveness and the sustainability of our current aircraft through transforming uh, our organisations, our training and our workforce structures. In July 2020, the Australian Government released the 2020 Defence Strategic Update combined with the Force Structure Plan, outlining a new strategy for defence and the capability investments required to deliver it. The Strategic Update sets out the challenges in Australia's strategic environment and the implications for defence planning. It provided a new strategic policy framework to ensure Australia is able and is understood to be willing to deploy military power to shape our environment, deter actions against our strategic interests, and when required, respond with military force. Australia now faces an environment of increased strategic competition. The introduction of more capable military systems enabled by technological change and the increasingly aggressive use of diverse grey zone tactics to coerce states under the threshold for a conventional military response. Overall, this is expected to lead to a heightened risk of high intensity conflict with lessened strategic warning time than has been seen in decades. This is coupled with increased threats to human security, such as pandemics, growing water and food scarcity, uh, which are likely to result in increased political instability and friction, particularly within uh, 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 poorer countries, uh, and are likely to reshape our security environment, including in the Indo-Pacific. These threats will be compounded with population growth, urbanisation, and extreme weather events in which climate change plays a part. And while the response to these challenges is frequently discussed in terms of platforms such as our submarines, helicopters and tanks, as leaders we must understand that meeting such challenges will rely upon our ability to provide more people in more teams for more missions more often. It is therefore concerning that at the same time that the demands placed on the Australian Defence Force are increasing rapidly, we're finding that our current workforce models are proving increasingly unsuited to the contemporary environment. Demographic change is limiting the effectiveness of our traditional means of attracting and retaining people with the necessary skills to fully utilise the raft of new platforms being introduced into service across the next decade. The complexity and the speed of technological change requires a more contemporary point of need training system able to keep pace with the human machine interface. The rate of geostrategic change demands agility and adaptability in our workforce, in our workforce management systems, and the means by which defence teams with other organisations to deliver effects and options to the Government of Australia and shifts in the labour market are altering the propensity of Australians to consider service life as a viable employment option. The confluence of environmental, technological and demographic change coupled with the emergent need to undertake operations, uh, com uh, competition and conflict simultaneously 
is termed accelerated warfare by the Chief of Army. This requires us to be an army in motion, balancing the needs to be ready now, to meet current requirements, but also to evolve our organisation, our culture and our people to bring the next generation of platforms into service and thus be future ready. It's for this reason that the Army has developed the Force Structure Implementation Plan, which is a roadmap of our modernisation of our structures, our equipment, our organisations to support the required level of transformation over the coming decades. One of the work packages within the AFSIP is the raising of Army Aviation Command, with myself as its inaugural commander. As many of you may be aware, the Australian Army has faced significant challenges with its current generation of rotary wing platforms. While supportability of the current generation of platforms has played a part, multiple reviews and restructures of the Army aviation capability uh, since 2002 have been unable to resolve three persistent challenges. Uh, these include unwieldy command and control with multiple points of accountability, organisational uh, complexity exacerbated by geographical dislocation, and the overarching requirement to manage the airworthiness of increasingly advanced systems. In order to remediate this, a decision was taken to reform Army aviation into a functional command optimised for accelerated warfare to generate and sustain Army's aviation elements for deployment. This places Army Aviation in a parallel structure to the existing functional commands of Forces Command, Special Operations Command, and the 1st and 2nd Divisions. Army Aviation Command is designed to align uh, command, control, force generation, capability management sponsorship, airworthiness management, and governance. Commander Army Aviation Command commands all of Army's aviation units, assumes military air operator accountable manager responsibilities for all of Army's aircraft, and therefore becomes the single point of accountability to the Chief of Army for Army's aviation capability. The end state is for Headquarters Army Aviation Command to reduce the burden of airworthiness and capability program sponsorship currently borne by other headquarters in Army and to optimise force generation and individual training and be poised to lead transformation of current and future Army aviation capabilities for Army. The formation of Army Aviation Command is only the beginning of changes underway for Army Aviation. As has been well publicised, we're also commencing a significant recapitalisation of our fleets, including the acquisition of AH-64 Echo Apache Guardian, UH-60 Mike Blackhawks, additional tactical uncrewed aerial systems and CH-47 Foxtrot Chinooks as we move towards future vertical lift in the next decades. In doing so, we have three key priorities. First is to stabilise our legacy platforms, including the ARH, or Armed Reconnaissance Helicopter Tiger, and the Multi-Royal Helicopter 90, or MRH-90 Taipan, to a level of sustainable uh, capability to provide a foot on the ground as we move forward. Secondly, we're reinforcing our enduring systems, including CH-47 Foxtrot Chinooks and our uh, AW139 General Support Utility Helicopters to provide a wider span of support to the nation, such as during the recent volcanic eruption uh, in Tonga uh, and flooding in Northern Australia. And third, we'll prepare for the introduction of the new systems, including the Apaches, the new Blackhawks, uh, and our new tactical uncrewed aerial systems. I think that the history of the 
uh, ARH Tigers and MRH90 Taipan in Australia has been sufficiently litigated uh, in the public domain that I don't need to dwell on those here. However, despite recent government decisions, these systems will remain in service for several years yet. Uh, and during that time, we'll continue to rely on them. As such, we need to reset our expectations of them so that they can reliably achieve what we set and therefore stabilise our support system around them. To do this, we'll need to reinforce our enduring platforms at the core of which is the CH47 Foxtrot Chinooks. The CH47 Foxtrot is Defence's largest helicopter with a proven track record of supporting Australian Defence Force operations in Australia, our near region and further afield. The Chinook provided essential airlift capability in Afghanistan through the period 2006 to 2013 and has been instrumental in uh, relief efforts uh, domestically, including Operation Bushfire Assist, Operation Flood Assist, and also throughout our region. The reliability and the performance of our Chinook helicopters in both domestic and operational environments has really exceeded our expectations. It's an example of a mature, proven, reliable, and affordable helicopter and support system. Defence recently acquired four additional CH-47 Foxtrot Chinooks, increasing the fleet from 10 to a more effective and sustainable size of 14. The first two uh, additional Chinooks arrived in June 2021. The remaining two are due to be delivered in June of this year, 2022. The additional Chinooks will provide resilience to this essential fleet of battlefield lift uh, support helicopters. And while it technically falls into the category of new acquisitions, the recent government decision to pursue the acquisition of UH-60 Mike Blackhawks is also an example of our focus on mature, proven and reliable and affordable systems. Defence has requested information from the United States Government on the acquisition of up to 40 UH-60 Mike Blackhawks through foreign military sales. The UH-60 Mike is the latest version of the Blackhawk and is uh, combat proven in comparable roles, representing one of the largest single utility helicopter variants in the world. This acquisition will resolve current capability limitations and improve value for money through delivering a reliable, sustainable and enhanced battlefield utility helicopter for defence. Regarding the remaining upcoming acquisitions, while the uh, introduction of these new platforms may seem like a routine activity, uh, it must be understood that these are not like-for-like -like replacements, but a significant increment of additional capability, which will uh, require significant organisational changes uh, to support them. Uh, and the best example is for the H64 Echo and the tactical uh, UAS uh, systems. The acquisition of the H64 Echo Apache Guardian under Land 4503 1, armed reconnaissance helicopter replacement, seeks to provide an armed reconnaissance capability that is assured in the future battle space out to at least 2050. Army is seeking approval for the acquisition of 29 Apache Guardians. The schedule is deliberately aggressive. Introduction into service activities commence in 2023 with initial operating capability scheduled for 2026 and final operating capability for 2029. Apache is also a proven and mature platform that will provide an enhancement in reconnaissance, attack and security operations. Apache is equipped with systems that will provide an increased ability to sense battle space actors and conditions and can attack targets with a scalable range of kinetic and non-kinetic effects 
across the battle space to provide greater situational awareness and enhanced decision making across the joint force. Its capabilities represent a level of firepower and connectedness that our combat aviators at the 1st Aviation Regiment are keen to deliver to the Army and to the Joint Force. Apache will survive and thrive in the close and deep contested battle space, utilising sophisticated self-protection and manoeuvre at speeds and ranges commensurate with other in-service rotary wing capabilities. Apache capabilities will include tactical data link, fire control radar, modernised uh, target acquisition and designation site, cognitive decision aiding system, modernised radar frequency interferometer, and advanced aerial teaming, formerly known as manned unmanned teaming. Similarly, Land 129 Phase 3 tactical uncrewed aerial system enhancement, upgrade and or replacement, seeks to acquire new tactical un uncrewed aerial systems to replace the Shadow 200 with initial operating capability planned for fiscal year 23-24 and final operating capability in fiscal year 25-26. The project will deliver a resilient airborne um, I-STAR capability for the combat brigade that accelerates joint force tempo. It will be introduced into service and be operated by the 20th Regiment Royal Australian Artillery. The system will be deployed as configurable tactical uncrewed aerial system capability bricks, each capable of 24-7 coverage of a focal area. Six tactical uncrewed aerial system capability bricks will be delivered, equipped with highly integrated protected mobility vehicles capable of providing battle management, intelligence and targeting outputs. The project includes a growth of a third tactical uncrewed aerial systems subunit at the 20th Regiment and updated facilities for housing new equipment and conducting training, including improved simulation. Acquisition of the replacement system will reduce performance issues uh, noted in the in-service Shadow 200, which is approaching the end of its service life, including uh, being runway independent, protected mobility, secure data links, a reduced footprint, a lower noise signature, a modular and multi-payload capability, longer endurance and enhanced teaming capabilities. Of note, we're delivering against sovereign industrial capability priorities by harnessing innovation and using industry to design and upgrade surveillance capability, such as utilising an Australian-made Spitfire camera gimbal. This is the first successful defence innovation hub proposal to be fully integrated into service. You will note that these two capabilities are being introduced in parallel as a part of the Battlefield Aviation uh, Program's attack and ISTAR line of effort. There is a compelling case to bring these two combat systems much closer as the basis of a formidable aerial combined arms team at the core of a broader combined arms ecosystem. Just like the infantry, and the armour form the core of a powerful ground-based combined arms team complemented by the combat engineers, ground-based air defence and artillery in the first instance. So too should, in my view, the gunners of the 20th Regiment and the combat aviators of the 1st Aviation Regiment form the nucleus of an aerial combined arms team complemented with intelligence, electronic warfare, and long-range rockets. Together, this aerial uh, arms team comes together as a formidable air-land combat team with our armoured ground reconnaissance regiments, special forces, logistics, and C4 ISR capabilities that represent the connected, protected, 
enabled and lethal capability at the heart of Army's contribution to the Joint Force. One example of this, in a future ready context, is described by the British Army in their future soldier system, in the establishment of their deep reconnaissance brigade combat team to include Apache, Wildcat rotary wing I-Star helicopters, tactical UAS, multiple launch rocket systems, electronic warfare, and Ajax armoured reconnaissance elements at the heart of this combat system. This type of advanced teaming forms a step change of how we'd operated in the past and nests with wider Army and Australian Defence Force modernisation initiatives, including the acquisitions of uncrewed combat aerial vehicles through the Royal Australian Air Force's Loyal Wingman Project and ongoing Army experimentation with autonomous vehicles. Although it preserves at the heart Army's focus on combined arms warfare uh, as uh, a very important uh, means by which we achieve success in the battle space. Shortly after assuming the role of Commander Army Aviation Command, I undertook a 100-day assessment of Army's aviation capability. The 100-day assessment identified a need to develop a holistic uh, strategic framework for providing coherent and consistent direction across the capability to enhance planning and inform strategic thinking uh, both now and into the future. It was determined that the framework would encompass a new fighting concept and will ensure that Army Aviation Command realises the uh, Army Force Structure Implementation Plan work package for Army's aviation capability while remaining culturally and operationally fully aligned and in lockstep with Army. This fighting concept will be expressed as a future operating concept document which will be realised and harnessed through the development of an Army aviation strategy. The future operating concept document is to describe and consequently set the requirement for how Army aviation capability will fight as a component of the combined arms in order to generate land power to the joint force. It must meet the requirements uh, of Army to deliver land power to the joint force in land, amphibious and special operations environments, both domestically and abroad. The document must align to the Chief of Army's guidance uh, as expressed in Army's contribution to Defence Strategy Edition 2, Army in Motion, to meet the demands of accelerated warfare. Principally, the concept answers uh, how Army aviation will respond to the need for increased capacity as described in the following passage of that document, and I quote, Army is increasing its agility and capacity and introducing new concepts and capability. This sets the conditions for Army to provide more teams for more missions and more operating environments more often. The concept is to be grounded in the lessons, concepts and organisations that have evolved in our recent past to include the Aviation Battle Group, the Aviation Amphibious Combat Element and the Special Operations Aviation Task Group. From there, it will take a pragmatic yet visionary view of what can be conceivably incorporated into the combat aviation system with a focus of the period 2028 to 2023, which approximates to the final operating capability of the H-64 Echo under Land 4503, and then with lower fidelity onwards to 2043. The concept is to be evolutionary and operationally feasible from that time frame, ensuring that it outlines how Army aviation will deliver more support in more places more often. Importantly, the concept is to bring clarity to the roles, tasks, organisations and characteristics that Army Aviation employs in the battle space for the benefit of the consumption of the broader combined arms team. 
The Army Aviation Strategy will establish the vision, the mission, the goals, objectives, major lines of operation and decision points across a 20-year uh, time horizon from 2023 with higher fidelity in the first 10 years. The strategy will meet the needs of the future operating concept document in the first instance, describing how Army's aviation capability will achieve the Army Force Structure Implementation Plan. It will encompass the Battlefield Aviation Program strategy, which is a strong focus on major systems. Importantly, the strategy will take a broader view to include disposition and the fundamental inputs to capability, with a particular emphasis on workforce, training, simulation, and industry. The strategy must be designed to offer leadership across the entire Army aviation enterprise, including, but not exclusively, Army, the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group, and our valued industry partners. One key concept to be explored is the strengthening of the 16th Aviation Brigade and the Army Aviation capability as a whole to improve our capacity to meet ongoing and future operational liability. Principally, there are not enough people within the 16th Aviation Brigade or the Army Aviation capability to meet the demands that we assess will be placed on them. The Army Force Structure Implementation Plan introduces two organisations, the Aviation Support Battalion and the Domestic General Support Aviation Squadron to enhance capacity. Each of these organisations represents the vessels for import and growth of substantial total workforce system in categories and service options other than the regular Army service category, CIRCAT 7. The Army Aviation Strategy will define these with a view to commence operationalisation from 2024-2025. The key outcomes associated with this growth allow for more assured Army aviation effects in more places more often. As you can see, we certainly have our hands full between a significant body of work in developing new strategy for the way forward as well as the significant recapitalisation of our fleet. Overall, this begs the question of how we can balance generating more teams in more places more often, which are ready now, with freeing up organisational capacity for future ready uh, for these new platforms in a workforce constrained environment. This was a key focus of the 100 day assessment to understand how we might go about navigating this challenging environment. The 100-day assessment revealed a number of key points in this area. First, personnel within the capability already feel they're being asked to do too much with available resources. The need for low-density, high-demand capabilities, such as aviation, is expected to increase into the future. And major increments in capability coming uh, in the future include A-64 Echo, Tactical Uncrewed Aerial Systems, and UH-60 Mike, for which we lack sufficient latent capacity to support introduction into service. So the question for aviation becomes, how do we support the wide span of tasks for ready now with a brittle, specialised capability while generating offsets to free up capacity for future ready? Now, this will require bold, strategic change to remediate issues quickly and to set the preconditions for introduction into service of H64 Echo and to meet increasing future demands. And we have commenced this effort. When I first joined the Australian Army, we were structured around a model in which almost all functions were provided by uniformed personnel. This ranged from aircraft maintenance to engineering support through to catering, medical and pay administration. However, over time, it became apparent that as a small military, the requirement to furnish these services from a finite number of uniformed men and women was artificially constraining the capability of the Australian Defence Force. As a result, a process began, uh, which was colloquially known as feeding the tail to the teeth, in which services 
which did not necessarily need to be performed by uniform members, such as all of our pay administration, or only in certain uh, in circumstances, such as medical and catering, were increasingly undertaken by contractors, with resulting personnel savings being reinvested in army-only functions, such as the combat arms, uh, which therefore maximised the combat power which could be generated by a combat force of finite size. Within the Army aviation capability, this process saw the majority of engineering support provided by contractors, often aircraft original equipment manufacturers, uh, along with the more complex maintenance tasks, such as deep maintenance and component level uh, of overhaul. While this model achieved its stated objectives, it was not without its shortcomings. The transactional nature of the contractual arrangements with their industry partners set preconditions for friction to develop in circumstances where aircraft were delayed in deep maintenance, parts failed to return from overhaul at the required rate, or engineering advice was not forthcoming. We learned a lot from this experience, including more blended workplaces to better leverage deep industry skills. However, we need to be less transactional and more transformative as we go forward. We need to move away from a model where everything is insourced or outsourced, an army's cultural aversion to ceding control to outside, uh, outside parties. To do this, we must realise that defence and industry come together in a more united enterprise, which provides holistic, inclusive and strategic leadership to deliver what is required of us by our nation and its citizens. In doing so, we can break down barriers of us versus them and cooperate more effectively. While we've already made some great strides in this endeavour, there is much more to be done to prepare us for the systems of the future. In a similar vein to enhancing the nature of our relationships with our valued industry partners, the Australian approach to our reserve forces has undergone a profound change during my time in uniform. In addition to the traditional function of providing a base for scaling the regular forces during crisis, the Army Reserve was also used as a reservoir of capabilities which were principally outsourced, but occasionally required of the uniform force during operations and large-scale exercises, such as catering and medical. It also provided a mechanism for former members of the regular force to continue rendering limited service around their civilian employment. The assessed limitations on the return on investment provided by a reserve force with this limited scope uh, reduced the equipment and training opportunities available to the force and drove a perception that the reserves were an adjunct uh, rather than a part of the Australian Defence Force. This reduced the flexibility from within which, with which our total workforce could be used as well as reducing the appeal of reserve service due to the lack of apparent value placed on it. It's in large part for this reason, coupled with changing workforce expectations outlined earlier, that the Australian Defence Force introduced the total workforce system in 2016 to provide defence with the flexibility and the agility it needs to meet its current and future workforce demands. The total workforce system acknowledges that the people that our people are our most valuable asset. And to attract and retain the right people, defence needs a contemporary, flexible and agile workforce environment. For individuals, the total workforce system recognises that there's a life outside the Australian Defence Force. To help individuals achieve the right balance between their personal commitments and service responsibilities, the total workforce system introduced the service spectrum to provide more options in the way that people can serve, rather than the traditional split between the regular and reserve forces, the total workforce system provides options spanning standby and full-time service through ad hoc and routine part-time service, as well as flexible uh, working arrangements. The view uh, is to develop a one army workforce with a mix of full and part-time members that consistently attracts and retains the best talent. It also provides 
opportunities for temporary changes to service, including the gap year program, uh, known as ServOp G, periods of continuous full-time service for reserves, or ServOp C, and shared workforce arrangements between defence and industry, or ServOp D. Up until recently, Army Aviation has made limited use of the flexibility provided by our reserve forces. The high levels of training and proficiency required of our air crew, ground crew and maintenance staff was considered to be a poor fit for short uh, modular training systems of the reserve, as well as the intermittent nature of their service. To that end, the reserves who supported the capability were almost exclusively drawn from former regular members, with no pathways into Army aviation being available for the reserves making workforce mobility exclusively one way. This shortfall became apparent during the disruptions to the airline industry resulting from the pandemic. The aviation capability lacked the mechanisms to enable it to capitalise on a sudden uh, and significant spike in under and underemployed workforce to induct skilled workers into the regular or the reserve forces. Uh, while we most certainly did uh, return uh, many former members into the Army aviation capability, we certainly uh, have identified that there was a much greater scope uh, for us to achieve that outcome. This really demonstrated that the aviation capability is wholly reliant on either building or training from the unskilled workforce or buying through contracted support our workforce with no ability to borrow workforce from industry or bridge skilled and experienced workers into our organisation. In order to remediate this, we have a number of new initiatives underway. The first is the Aircraft Technical Specialist, which provides a pathway for maintainers to horizontally progress through skill depth rather than traditional vertical advancement through rank progression. This enables deep technical expertise. This has seen the introduction of a series of new rank designations for the first time in living memory, which enabled members to continue enhancing their technical skills, keeping the best technical experts on the tools rather than remove them to fulfill supervisory roles. This also enables us to invest in developing new skills and capabilities through these individuals due to the changed return uh, on investment calculus. While this scheme is currently focused on increasing retention in members who might otherwise seek a technically focused career in industry, by decoupling skill and pay from rank, it also provides uh, a mechanism by which skilled maintainers could be bridged into our workforce from industry. This had not been previously considered feasible due to the tactical and leadership skills required of our senior maintainers and non-commissioned officers within the Army. In future, there is a possibility to expand to more trades and to the officer workforce, such as our technical engineers. Another initiative is opening more recruiting pathways via reserve service and the gap year program. This provides pathways for trades with lower training burdens, such as our ground crew aircraft support and our ground crew mission support trades, into the Army aviation capability as reservists, as well as more entry mechanisms with pathways to full-time service. In a similar vein to the Total Workforce System Initiative, the Australian Defence Force is exploring transformation initiatives to improve workforce capacity and flexibility. At present, our maintainers undertake a lengthy training continuum following recruiting which provides all of the trade and the aircraft training they require up front. This leads them to spending up to three years in training before arriving at the unit, as well as locking them into a trade and an aircraft type uh, early in their careers. Due to the requirement to gain experience before undertaking more complex work, much of this training is underutilised for the first few years in the unit, by which time uh, it may have atrophied. What we are exploring 
are options to deliver a more modular training pipeline, which enables us to get our soldiers into units sooner and at a lower level of training before developing them over time towards higher levels of technical qualifications, experience and skill. This may also provide opportunities to make decisions on streaming towards trades and aircraft uh, types later, thus enabling our men and women to be better informed decision makers uh, and a system that is more able to respond to changing workforce demands. A more modular training system will also facilitate the expansion of reserve pathways into the Army aviation capability and bridging experienced workforce segments from industry. This is happening elsewhere in Army at present. For instance, the vehicle mechanic trade into such units as the Army Reserve's Combat Service Support Battalions. Now, this will be critical for Army aviation as the successful introduction into service of new systems such as the H64 Echo Apache Guardian requires additional efficiency in mass and logistics and maintenance effects that can only be provided by a dedicated uh, ground support unit. However, the constraints of full-time uniform workforce growth make this challenging. What's required, therefore, is a more creative approach to generate this effect. Emerging from the total workforce system is Service Category 5, Service Option D, which provides the benefits of a shared workforce model for workers in finite uh, amounts nationally to work concurrently for Army and an outside employer. Both organisations share the costs of recruiting, development and employment. This provides real workforce growth without the requirement for additional full-time personnel, while providing greater flexibility and geographic st stability for our workforce and their families. It's for this reason, and in line with the Army Force Structure Implementation Plan, that I'm pr prioritising the raising of the ground support unit, utilising the total workforce system, to develop a composite workforce comprising regular, reserve and shared industry staff to provide a depth and breadth in aviation logistics and maintenance support which the Australian Army currently lacks. And it's not only for support functions that we seek to unlock the potentials of our reserve workforce in industry. Specialist capabilities such as aviation, for which there is no reserve equivalent will continue to face the burdens for defence aid to the civil community and humanitarian assistance and disaster response, while Army transitions this requirement to the second division, a part of the Army Reserve. This leads to a requirement to find a means to offload our combat squadrons of this demand while taking advantage of the Australian aerospace sector and former members of the capability who remain within the broader uh, civil industry. While the Australian Army lacks the scale to keep reserve members proficient on expensive combat platforms, we have a wealth of experience on common general aviation support platforms, including AW139 helicopters and King Air fixed-wing aircraft. Unlocking this capability to generate a total workforce system enabled domestic uh, support aviation unit known as a General Support Aviation Squadron, to offset the defence aid to the civil community requirement, would thus generate significant dividends, enabling us to use combat aircraft for combat tasks in support of combined arms and joint forces, while still supporting the frequent but low complexity tasks in support of Australia and our neighbours in the Pacific community. This would also be an opportunity to retain and recruit civilian qualified aircrew through reserve service, which is currently impossible due to the uh, inability to retain or retain a category on an operational aircraft. While still developmental, this capability is already proven through the use of AW139 helicopters operated by B Squadron, 5th Aviation Regiment, which held domestic high-risk weather season response over the recent uh, northern summer including response as a part of Operation Flood Assist in South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales. So in conclusion, this brings me to the end of my presentation today. While we've covered a lot of ground, including Australia's strategic environment, the formation of Army Aviation Command, 
New acquisitions and organisational and workforce changes required to support it into the future. I would leave you with a few parting remarks. If there's anything to take away from the presentation today, it's that Army Aviation Command is an Army functional command raised by Army for the Army. It's a functional command for ready now and future ready. It's a functional command led by soldiers, delivered by soldiers, and above all else, for the soldier. Thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure and privilege to be able to thank uh, Major General uh, Jobson for that lengthy, illuminating, and rich in content address. It's very difficult to unpack what was a very wide-ranging uh, coverage, and could I acknowledge and thank him for the extensive use of audio visuals, uh, a significant number of very useful uh, slides to illustrate some of the points that he was making and the very clear and coherent way in which he tied it together. I'm sure that this presentation would very much benefit from being viewed several times because it's very rich in certain aspects of content which I both valued and enjoyed. Firstly, it was an excellent coverage of what I'd call the status of the new Army Aviation Headquarter upgrade. It was a very comprehensive review of the existing equipment and technologies that are currently in service, are planned to be in service, or are scheduled to come into service, and I particularly appreciated the coherent way in which that information was laid out and explained. I also found it very stimulating that towards the end of the presentation, the, we were given an insight into the kind of strategic thinking that is, if you like, guiding our senior leaders as they approach the issues of rapid changing uh, cultural and economic and political environments, as they approach the challenges of rapidly changing technology uh, asymmetric, asymmetric warfare. I mean, all of us, unfortunately, at the time of viewing this, uh, watching the instability of the Ukrainian situation, we're being reported of the pressures of the Asia-Pacific region, and I was particularly struck by the coherent way in which Major General Dobson outlined for us how they're approaching thinking through these issues and the kind of strategies that are evolving to deal with them. I'd also like to thank him for finishing with what was a very powerful mini summary of the challenges of a highly technological branch of the military dealing with the problems of rapid upgrades of equipment, the challenges of attracting people into this kind of service, and if you have not particularly paid attention I would urge you to have a look at the final aspects of the presentation where the Major General unpacked for us some of the very, in my opinion, innovative methods by which he's planning to integrate reservists, uh, civilian shared employees, as well as the traditional full-time ADF personnel um, into gaining maximum value from their employment. So on behalf of Roosie, New South Wales and all of those who will be viewing it, can I thank you for the very significant amount of time that you obviously put into preparation, the very fluent delivery with which we were privileged to see the presentation and the very rich content that you have provided for us. On behalf of all of our members, can I wish you every success as the first commander of Army Aviation for a Command, and we thank you very much for the insights that you have shared with us today. For all of our viewers, I hope that you'll continue to follow Roosy New South Wales. Please check our website and our newsletters. Could I remind you that if you'd like to receive them, go to the website and sign up to get our newsletters because we have some other very useful and significant uh, sessions coming soon, and we hope that you'll share them with us. Again, 
Thank you very much for being with us on this webcast today. It's Michael Howe signing off with thanks.